The Bellevue Sanatorium for the Insane, Switzerland. On the 27th of July, 1932, a female inmate slipped through an open window and made a getaway. In the local town, she boarded a train heading for the border with Germany and freedom. But just on the point of escape, she was apprehended. For the authorities, it was just another day managing the strange inmates of the local asylum. But this woman was no ordinary inmate. This woman was Prince Philip's mother. We all know about the Queen Mum, so outgoing, so well publicized, so loving of publicity, in fact. Well, we forget there was another Queen Mum, very eccentric, but also incredibly strong-willed. Unlike the Queen Mum, Prince Philip's mother was born a princess, but turned her back on royal life. You didn't think of Aunt Alice as a cosy old aunt. You thought of her as somebody rather unique, actually. She was locked away in mental hospitals and subjected to experimental treatments by psychiatrists, including Sigmund Freud. Nobody wanted to talk about it, and it was regarded as, as rather um, hushed up. But she overcame mental illness and physical disability to become an unlikely hero of World War II. This is the strange and remarkable story of Prince Philip's mother, Princess Alice, one of the royal family's best-kept secrets. Princess Alice Battenberg's start in life couldn't have been more royal. Born at Windsor Castle in 1885, she was a great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Although her parents were more German than British, Alice was raised as an English princess. But from childhood, she was set apart from the rest of her family by a profound disability. She was stone deaf. And my grandmother realized that she had to just get used to coping with her disability herself. She said to the family, look, if Alice doesn't hear and doesn't understand what you said, it's quite important not to repeat it so that she learns to stand on her own feet. Her mother's tough love worked. By the age of 18, Alice could not only speak clearly, but also lip-read in three languages. And in 1902, at the coronation celebrations of King Edward VII, she met and fell in love with the glamorous Prince Andrew, youngest son of King George I of Greece. She was dotty about him, absolutely mad for him. Really, really deeply in love. He was very entertaining and very charming. And, and she fell hook, line, and sinker. After their wedding in 1903, Alice set up home with her husband in her newly adopted country. At the royal family's palace in Athens, Alice settled into her allotted role as a princess and mother. In 10 years, she produced four daughters and even managed to win over an increasingly anti-monarchist Greek public. The Princess Alice was the most famous from the nymphs of Georgiou I. And I have to say that the appropriateness of her το γεγονός ότι ήταν ξανθή και γαλανή, αυτό άρεσε πολύ στους Έλληνες. Ε, η, η αμεσότητα που είχε με τον κόσμο. The Greek idyll didn't last. In marrying Prince Andrew, Alice had hitched herself to the most unstable royal family in Europe. In 1912, a brutal war broke out between the Greeks and their bitter rivals, the Turks. Determined to make herself useful, 
Alice left her children and headed straight for the front, organizing a series of desperately needed battlefield hospitals. She got really stuck in. She was there in the front for months on end, often working through the night in very, very primitive conditions, dealing with people who were being shot up all around her, losing limbs, and she was there literally wrapping the bandages. She was hands on. God, what things we saw. Shattered arms, legs and heads, such awful sights. Cast off bandages knee high, the corridor full of blood. This was just the start of 10 traumatic years for Alice and her family. The First World War triggered a decade of conflict in Greece between pro and anti-royalist forces. In 1922, Republican troops entered Athens. Alice's brother-in-law, the king, fled the country. But her husband, Prince Andrew, was arrested and put on trial by a revolutionary court. It was all so awful. My, my aunt did, did have a, a very difficult time because, of course, there was a definite threat that my uncle Andrea might have ended up being executed for not being on the right side. They must have come under a great deal of pressure. To add to her worries, Alice had just given birth to a fifth child. In June 1921, Prince Philip was delivered on the kitchen table of Alice's country home. Philip was born sixth in line to the increasingly beleaguered Greek throne, but the child was blissfully oblivious to the crisis engulfing his family. Philip sits with bare legs on the hard road and crawls on it without minding the stones. He laughs all day long. I have never seen such a cheerful baby. But there was no time for celebrations. In December 1922, Philip's father, Prince Andrew, was convicted of disloyalty by the revolutionary authorities and faced a death sentence. When Prince Andrew was granted a last-minute stay of execution, the family seized their opportunity to flee. With the baby Prince Philip stowed in an orange crate as a makeshift cot, Alice and her family boarded a British warship and sailed into a humiliating exile. Alice's life as a conventional royal princess was over. In 1923, Princess Alice and her family, including the 18-month-old Prince Philip, arrived in Paris as refugees. In their flight from Greece, Alice and her husband had not only lost their fortune, but also much of their purpose. I talked to Prince Philip about this. He said to me, my recollection of the 1920s in Paris was that we were a very happy family and it was a very good time. And indeed, if you talk to witnesses, they'll talk about their bucket and spade holidays at the seaside. They will talk about the father, Prince Andrew, being there and being very charming, very amusing, but there was strain. These fleeting images rediscovered during the making of this film and seen here for the first time on television, offer a unique glimpse into Prince Philip's family at the time of their exile in Paris in the 1920s. In front of the camera, Philip's father, his sister, and his mother put on a brave face. But beneath the surface, the pressures of exile were beginning to tell. Ξαφνικά υπάρχει ένα τεράστιο πρόβλημα χρημάτων και ζουν ουσιαστικά με την βοήθεια πλούσιων συγγενών για έναν άνθρωπο υπερήφανο όπως ήταν ο Ανδρέας αλλά από εκεί και πέρα έχει την αίσθηση ότι ένα κομμάτι του εαυτού του έχει, έχει μείνει πίσω στην Ελλάδα και έχει πεθάνει. 
While Prince Andrew brooded on his fate, Philip's mother was left isolated and emotionally vulnerable. For her, it was very, very frustrating when big family groups, which often happened, we would be 20 around the table. And then, of course, she, she was lost, you know, she couldn't see people's lips. And suddenly, somebody would start roaring with laughter at the end of the table. And she'd think it was a joke about her, which, of course, it never was. Trapped in her silent world, dark thoughts began to prey on Alice's mind. In 1928, aged 43, she announced a sudden conversion to the Greek Orthodox Church. But increasingly, her religious beliefs were anything but orthodox. Princess Alice seems to have become increasingly religious, very, very preoccupied with the spiritual. She began to tell people that she had a very intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. She used sexual language and spoke about flirtations with Jesus Christ and so forth. She ultimately came to believe that she had a photograph signed by Jesus Christ. And what we see in Princess Alice is what sometimes can be called religious delusions, not ordinary religiosity. My poor Alice is in a quite abnormal state. She has visions of Christ and is told that she will soon have a message to deliver to the world. She wanders about the house praying. I think she has anemia of the brain from too much contemplation. In desperation, Alice's family turned to the fashionable new science of psychiatry. The sanatorium Schloss Tegel, the first psychotic intramural sanatorium founded and erected by Ernst Simmel, who's contributed enormously to the literature. In February 1930, Alice was persuaded to leave her son Philip and check in to an experimental psychiatric clinic near Berlin, run by the pioneering Dr. Ernst Simmel. We are standing in front of the sanatorio uh, of Tegel, which was built as a special psychiatric hospital in the April 1927. It was a new idea to treat patients so severely mentally ill that they could not visit the doctors in, the, in their offices or in the institutes. There were phobias, obsessive compulsive neurosis, and also addictions of different kinds, alcohol, cocaine, and so on. And therefore, Simmel tried to treat patients who other places could not successfully be treated. Princess Alice of Greece now found herself in the company of some of Europe's most disturbed psychiatric patients. One person who remembers the Tegel is Victor Ross, whose mother worked at the hospital at the time Princess Alice was a patient. I would have been 13, 12, 13, something like that. I wasn't inside the building very often. It was really parts of it were actually out of bounds to me uh, for obvious reasons. I spent most of my time in the park, really, but I certainly saw people having epileptic fits. I certainly saw people who shouted and cursed and spat. Pretty, I mean, crazy people. I remember they used to roll on the, on the grass and say, I'm getting better, I'm getting better. Every day I'm getting better. I'm better today than yesterday, and uh, I'll be better tomorrow. Well, I was not convinced. Previously sealed medical files from the Tegel reveal that Simmel diagnosed Princess Alice with paranoid schizophrenia. She'd begun to hear voices and believed herself to be not only married, but also physically involved with Christ and with other religious figures, including Buddha. In his search for the origins of Alice's illness, Simmel discovered an important clue. 
one of Princess Alice's ladies-in-waiting, had told him privately off the record that the Princess Alice had a very, very deep passion for an Englishman back in the mid-1920s, which she had never consummated. And Zimmel suggested that there was something about her romantic history, her erotic history, that had got repressed or dammed up or complicated in some way. Alice would never disclose the identity of her mystery love, but Dr. Simmel believed the princess's frustrated desires were an important factor in her breakdown. Princess Alice, we must remember, was born to the royal family in 1885, at a time when women's bodies were encased in corsets and women were not really encouraged to have a sexuality beyond appropriative marital sexuality, certainly not in her milieu. And I, I think we must remember how shocking it would have been, not only to her relatives and friends, but to herself to have, perhaps, an erotic attraction towards someone other than her husband and not quite know what to do with these feelings. Seeking advice for how to treat his royal patient, Dr. Simmel now turned to a famous colleague and mentor. The visitor's book for the Tegel Clinic reveals that in 1930, Sigmund Freud, the father of psychoanalysis himself, visited the Tegel and personally reviewed Princess Alice's case. His recommendations were shocking and controversial. Extraordinarily, Freud recommended that Princess Alice might be given x-rays to her ovaries. Now, when I first read this in the published case notes, I was really very, very shocked indeed, because his entire psychology is based on non-biological treatments, non-medical treatments, to get them to talk, the talking cure, not to give them x-rays. So this prescription for Princess Alice is really very anomalous and very perplexing indeed. The explanation for Freud's unusual advice lies in his connection with a Viennese scientist who specialised in the study of hormones and sexuality. In the 1920s, Eugen Steinach performed a series of radical experiments, including transplanting the testicles of gay men in order to cure their condition. Steinach also speculated that X-rays could be used to accelerate the menopause, triggering hormonal changes that could cure mental illness. At uh, the time when Alice came to the hospital, they were discussing, especially Freud and Simmel, discussing whether hormones could um, help uh, to, for a breakout of schizophrenia and severe psychosis. And in the case of Princess Alice, his advice was to make an X-ray of the gonads to accelerate her, her menopause, so that uh, cool down her libido and her sexual excitement. Today we would laugh about it, but nevertheless, the, uh, the endocrinology and the hormones the studies began at that time. In March 1930, the 45-year-old princess was escorted to a treatment room and her reproductive organs subjected to a concentrated stream of X-rays. There is no evidence that she was consulted about her treatment or consented to it, or that it produced any improvement in her health. Soon afterwards, Princess Alice discharged herself and returned to her family, declaring herself fit and well. Alice's mother disagreed. Her illusions are still firmly rooted. Her face has altered, and her expression, especially in the eyes, is altered too. When she is enjoying being among us, I feel a brute, and then again, I clearly realize the need of her going away. 
She did behave quite strangely. And in those days, again, you see, it sounds awful to say it, but if, if people behaved in a strange manner, then what people did was remove them from their family's situation and put them in some sort of a clinic where, you know, it didn't matter what they did. On the 2nd of May, 1930, while the eight-year-old Prince Philip was taken out for the day, Alice received an unexpected visit. I mean, the most awful thing is that pretty much one day her mother takes Prince Philip off for a picnic and by the time he comes home, his mother's gone. And it's literally a car and men in white coats coming to take her away. Philip's mother was forcibly bundled into a car and given a powerful sedative concealed inside an orange. Shortly after midnight, Alice crossed the border into Switzerland and arrived at the Bellevue Sanatorium. Prince Philip's mother was no longer just a patient, but a prisoner. Nobody wanted to talk about it, and it was regarded as, as rather um, hushed up um, and not very well treated or understood. So I think my aunt would have suffered very much. It was difficult to talk to other people about it because they were embarrassed or ashamed and all the nonsense. But in those days, of course, it was something to be kept very quiet about. The Bellevue was an exclusive Swiss sanatorium that catered for the mentally ill amongst Europe's richest families. But it could offer little in the way of effective treatment. For the next two and a half years, Alice was detained at the Bellevue. Protesting her sanity, she demanded her freedom and even made a daring escape attempt. But Alice had not only lost her liberty, she'd also been abandoned by her husband. Well, Prince Andrew was not at all supportive, I don't think. I think that by the time that um, Princess Alice went into the nursing home at Kreuzlingen, I think he, he had fundamentally had enough, and I personally believe that he, he renounced, uh, you know, any responsibility for his wife at that point. Well, I mean, he went and lived in the south of France, and he had mistresses, and um, he was no support to anybody. Although they would never divorce, the marriage was over. And Alice hadn't only lost her husband. While she was under lock and key, in the space of little over a year, all four of her daughters married German princes. They lock her away, and it was a terrible time for her. She isn't able to go to all the weddings. Uh, she doesn't get word of them. She becomes an isolated, lonely figure. But the hardest separation of all was from her youngest child, Prince Philip. In his mother's absence, Philip was packed off to boarding schools in England and during the holidays, farmed out to members of the extended family, including his uncle, Lord Mountbatten. He was a lovely cousin to have around, he really was. But it was very difficult childhood for him and, and uh, the time of the holidays, he never actually knew where he was going to go when he started the holidays. I mean, I suppose he was told just shortly before, but there wasn't the feeling of having a definite home like all children have. One of the royal family once said, Prince Philip was like a dog always looking for a basket. Um, and that characterized his early life. He was always being shuffled from pillar to post from one relative to the other. And as a kid of 11 or 12, to have your mother suddenly abducted from you, um, being told she was mad. And at the same time, your father is, is vanishing off with a mistress somewhere. It's not really surprising. He's got a pretty tough exterior. Uh, talking about Prince Philip, not having one special home, but having a series of different family homes all his life, really, as a young man. And I think this puts it rather clearly here, where 
he came to stay with us in our little cottage where he signs Philip. And he wrote under a dress, no fixed abode, which really says it all. On the 23rd of September, 1932, the doors of the Bellevue Psychiatric Hospital swung open, and for the first time in two and a half years, Prince Philip's mother was free. Alice had been demanding her release ever since her arrival at the Bellevue, and she'd been shocked to discover that she was detained not on the authority of doctors, but of her own family. Princess Alice didn't realized that it was um, her, her mother, really, who had taken that responsibility to put her in. And I think the answer is she was extremely angry when she found out, um, because she didn't know that. And I can understand totally how she would have felt betrayed. I don't think she ever completely forgave her mother for that, actually. As the worst of Alice's symptoms receded, her mother finally agreed to authorize her release. Alice now determined to turn her back on the family that she felt had let her down. It must be obvious to you and the whole family, as well as myself, that I should not take up my former life. For five years, Prince Philip's mother disappeared. She became a nomad, drifting around Germany and lodging in a succession of modest boarding houses. But one person remembers her. Almut Reuter was 11 years old when an unusual guest checked into the bed and breakfast hostel run by her parents here in Cologne. She came with a taxi, ganz normal, wie andere Leute auch. Wunder ein Professor, ein Banker, aber keine Prinzessin. Erst als Alice kam. Aber Prinzessin war natürlich außergewöhnlich, vor allen Dingen für Kinder. But the new resident on Bachemer Straße wasn't quite what the landlady and her daughter expected. Sagt ja, sie war nicht von dieser Welt, sie war anders. Völlig anders. Sie ging nie mehr auf die Straße. Und bei schönem Wetter saß sie auf unserer großen Terrasse und guckte ins Weite in den Himmel. Und ich fragte meine Mutter, was macht sie denn da immer? Ja, sie träumt, sagte meine Mutter. Und einmal habe ich gefragt, was sie denn sieht. Im Himmel. Die Heilige Barbara. Die Heilige Barbara. Alice was emerging from her breakdown with her intense religious faith intact. But as she regained her health, her thoughts also returned to her teenage son. Und meine Mutter hat sie sehr oft zum Kaffee eingeladen. Und einmal, ein einziges Mal, durfte ich bei ihr auf dem Schoß sitzen, weil sie gesagt hat, wie mein Sohn, wie Philipp. It would take a tragedy to bring Alice and Philip back together. In 1937, Alice's daughter Cecile was killed in an air crash, along with her husband and three children. At the funeral in Nazi Germany, Alice was reunited with the family for the first time in seven years. And in The Princess, the family recognized the Alice of old. I think that the death of her daughter Cecile was a real shock and seemed to sort of make her once again feel that actually, you know, there was, she was needed and she, she, should, she should be there to help her family. Suddenly there she was again. By the late 1930s, Alice's three surviving daughters were all married, 
their husbands, officers in Hitler's military. But there was one of her children whose future was still undecided. Her son, Prince Philip. In November 1938, with the Greek monarchy restored to power, Alice returned to Athens for the first time since her exile. And she wanted Philip to be part of her new life. Dear Philip, I have taken a small flat just for you and me. I found some furniture stored away which I have not seen since 1917. I'm so looking forward to your living in our flat. But there was a difficulty. During his mother's absence, Philip had been growing up under the wing of his ambitious uncle, Lord Mountbatten. He saw a bright future for Prince Philip in Britain's Royal Navy. Well, I think for Prince Philip, it, it must have been very difficult when his mother reappeared. She sort of felt that he ought to become a prince of Greece and get to know Athens better because there was a chance that he might one day be king of Greece, and that's what she had in mind. And, you know, they didn't see, see, see that at all. The 17-year-old Philip had to choose between an uncertain future in Greece with his mother and a promising naval career in Britain. I don't think that the family were keen for him to go and live with his mother. They would have felt that, you know, she hadn't been around all those years. A lot of people didn't really take her seriously. They thought she was just off on another of her sort of uh, kind of, you know, fanciful idea trips. So it's a bit sad for her, really, because, again, she had not known her son while he was growing up, and by then, in a sense, it was sort of too late. In 1940, Adolf Hitler's armies conquered Europe. And in April 1941, the swastika was raised over the Acropolis. Alice now found herself alone in Nazi-occupied Greece. Her son fighting in Britain's Royal Navy. Britain now stood alone against the Nazis. Elizabeth, the future Queen Mother, did her bit for the war effort, visiting bombed-out Londoners. But in occupied Athens, Prince Philip's mother offered help of a more practical kind. She set to work in a soup kitchen for the needy. Then the food ran out. Athens began to starve. I do remember my father being so worried about her because there she was, stuck in, in Athens. Great deprivation, very little food. And so my father was always on the lookout for any possibility of sending her a food parcel or money. And two or three times there was an opportunity here to somebody who would be able to get it through to her. And so he sends it and was so exasperated because she immediately gave it away. And at the dining room table or something, he'd say, ah, oh, Alice is driving me dotty, you know. I managed to send Commander so-and-so, he's taking a package and they're smuggling it through to her. What has she done? Given it away. Every time he sent her something. But Alice's greatest act of charity was still to come. In 1943, Nazi authorities in Greece began the deportation of Jews to death camps. In the city of Salonika, 60,000 Jews were rounded up, but a few escaped and fled south to Athens. Amongst them were the Cohens, one of the country's most prominent Jewish families and old friends of the Greek royal family. When word of the Cohen's plight reached Princess Alice, she faced a terrible decision. And uh, they, they were just passing the residence of Princess Alice. At the moment they passed, at the very moment they passed, a door opened and the lady-in-waiting of Princess Alice came out. She said to Tilde, we are looking for you. We are looking for you since yesterday. And Princess Alice wants absolutely to see you because she is ready to hide you. And it was a miracle. 
For more than a year, Alice concealed the Cohens on the top floor of her residence in central Athens. Discovery would have meant certain death for them and grave danger for Alice. All the people who had hidden Drews, it was at the risk of their own life. She came every day, every day. She took tea with them and she became very, 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 very good friend. The resourceful princess even managed to turn her disability into a weapon. One day, the Gestapo came and they wanted to know who lived in the residence. Princess Alice didn't answer. She said that she was deaf, and she was deaf. And she had no fear. She, she was very, very courageous. Without her, without any doubt, they would have perished, would have perished completely. And perished in a in a very, very monstrous way. Yes, she has been... She has been... Uh, she has been the angel of the family. In 1944, Athens was liberated. And with war over, Alice was free to visit her son for an important family occasion. At North Holt Aerodrome, our cameraman meets Princess Alice of Greece. The princess is the mother of Lieutenant Philip Mountbatten, formerly Prince Philip of Greece. While Princess Alice had been stuck in Athens, her son had fallen in love with another princess. Princess Elizabeth and Lieutenant Mountbatten will never forget July the 10th, 1947. With his engagement to the future queen, Philip's future was decided once and for all. Their Majesties, the King and Queen, were followed by Queen Mary and Princess Andrew of Greece, the bridegroom's mother. Alice had been prevented from attending the weddings of her four daughters. This one she was not going to miss. But there were some who raised an eyebrow at the bridegroom's unconventional mother. There were quite a few people at court who had reservations about him because of his family. Who was he? Where did he come from? And during the run-up to his engagement to Princess Elizabeth, he was staying at Windsor Castle, and he was being shown around the castle by a rather patronising courtier who was giving him a sort of rundown of the history of the castle. And Prince Philip interrupted the courtier and said, yes, thank you very much, I do know my mother was born here. Princess Alice of Greece, great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria, was back under the roof of the British royal family. But the mother-in-law to the future queen wasn't satisfied to slip into a life of royal luxury. As soon as the wedding was over, she disappeared. Prince Philip's 63-year-old mother was about to unveil her biggest shock yet. In June 1953, the eyes of the world were on London. Heads of state and royals from around the world had gathered for the most glittering state occasion in living memory, to see Queen Elizabeth crowned with Prince Philip at her side. But amongst the ermine, the jewels and the gold braid, there was one figure who stood out from the rest. Watch the coronation, and the camera, of course, concentrates on the royal party. But behind comes another solitary figure, a nun in grey, walking through the abbey. Who is it? Believe it or not, it's Princess Alice, the Duke of Edinburgh's mum. While the royal family had been preparing for the coronation, Princess Alice had been hard at work, 
founding her very own religious order. She called it the Sisterhood of Martha and Mary. And in the poor suburb of Athens, where she built a convent and an orphanage, still in use as a community centre today, Alice is still remembered. When Princess Aliki came to, our, to live in our neighbourhood, we thought that this princess, like the others, with the rich life. When we see um, a woman very simple, with changed mind, we saw that she was a nun. And it was very strange. We had never known a, a, a princess nun. Alice's latest incarnation was no sudden whim. Ever since her frontline nursing experience in the Balkan Wars, she'd been drawn to a life of service. 25 years after being locked up for her unorthodox religious ideas, Alice had finally found her calling. She invited me to go and stay in Athens. And uh, she lived in a tiny apartment, trying to, to catch novices to enter her order. And she did it very seriously. The young Greek girls were very obedient because there was one awful moment that she was going actually to inspect a hospital and a nun was driving and Aunt Alice suddenly says, left, left here. And so of course, left here, as she orders, the wheel is turned left, they go into a black wall. They were both carried into the hospital and stretchers. To fund her project, Alice had sold off the last of her royal jewellery collection, much to the dismay of family members, and her religious fervour continued to baffle. My grandmother was a, a bit sceptical about it, and I do remember her saying, whoever heard of an abbess who smoked and played canasta? But if some of the royal family found it hard to take Alice's faith seriously, to the poor of Athens, she was a godsend. I was an orphan, and uh, she, she embraced me and uh, kissed my hand. I was very proud. And from that moment, she called me my, my little neighbor. That woman could read your heart. And I must tell you something. I tried not to cry. And she was an idea for me. I must offer something, as this woman offers. And after many years, I, I came to the Red Cross and became a volunteer of the Red Cross. In 1967, history repeated itself. The Greek royal family was expelled from Athens by a military coup. Prince Philip's fiercely independent mother refused to budge. It took an aeroplane sent by Philip and a special request from the Queen herself to bring her home to the land of her birth. Alice moved into a small room in Buckingham Palace. After a lifetime separated by madness, war and family politics, Philip and his mother were together at last. And so there was this strange granny rattling round the palace. She insisted, apparently, on calling him Bubbikins, which had been her pet name for him as a child. They say that at Buckingham Palace, you could always tell when she was coming along the corridor because of the whiff of woodbines in the air. The idea of the Duke of Edinburgh's mum walking the corridors of Buckingham Palace, dressed as a nun, <laughs> sucking on a woodbine. It's wonderful, isn't it? Just two years after being reunited with her son, Princess Alice died at Buckingham Palace on the 5th of December, 1969. Her only worldly possessions were three dressing gowns. Shortly before her death, Alice wrote a farewell to her son. 
Dearest Philip, be brave. And remember, I will never leave you. And you will always find me when you need me most. All my devoted love, your old mama. But Prince Philip's mother had one final surprise in store. She told her family that she wanted to be buried on the Mount of Olives. And someone said, well, how are we going to get there to visit the grave? She said, well, you can take the bus. It would take two decades for Prince Philip to carry out his mother's final wish. In 1988, after years of negotiations between church authorities, Princess Alice's coffin was flown to Jerusalem and interred in the Orthodox Church on the Mount of Olives. It was the first time any member of the royal family has been to the State of Israel. Shortly afterwards, her son made a pilgrimage to her grave and accepted the highest possible honour on her behalf from the Jewish nation for her courageous actions during the Second World War. She was a person with a deep religious faith and she would have considered it to be perfectly natural human reaction to fellow beings in distress. This is the uh, place where the remains of Princess Alice are kept. Here, across the valley, just opposite here where we're standing, this is where the Great Judgment is going to be, and uh, all the three religions try to be buried in this area. That's why she's lying here under our church, and I guess uh, God has something to do with it as well. In the end, God is responsible for everything, so he probably arranged it. God.